Amen. I see him leading music uh, two or three times already in the last few uh, months. And uh, we thank the Lord for him and uh, his service to the Lord and his example. And I uh, appreciate that song. And it uh, means so much. And uh, I'm just glad that we could be here tonight. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to the book of Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5 verse 22. We are continuing our series on cultivating uh, the right fruits in our lives, cultivating uh, the fruit of the Spirit in our life. And you remember, uh, we also compared this with John chapter 15, that uh, the desire of the Lord is that we bear much fruit. You remember that? Uh, that is God's will for your life. You know, we always wonder what God's will is. Well, there's some things we already know what God intends for us to do, and certainly bearing fruit is one of those things in His plan. Uh, God desires us not just to be followers of Him, but fruitful followers uh, of Him. And so tonight, uh, as we look, we've looked the last few weeks, uh, we've looked at, uh, of course, let's, let's go ahead and read the Scripture there. 522, the Bible says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love. We looked at love. You remember that, the love of God, uh, the love that loves when there's uh, no reason to love at all there. Uh, then there's joy. That's a fruit of the Spirit that is centered in Christ. There's that peace. Uh, that peace that passeth all understanding, that is a fruit of the Spirit. But then there's the long-suffering, that suffering long, that patience there. Uh, then there's gentleness, we talked about that being kindness. And then goodness, we talked about that last week, and that is really just being obedient to the Word of God. We looked at that last week. And now we come to the next fruit that we should possess, and that is faith or faithfulness, as you see on the screen. Uh, let us pray tonight. Father, uh, I pray, Father, you'd help us tonight to understand this fruit that we should bear and multiply in our lives. Lord, you told us that we are the vines, or we are the branches, and you are the vine. Uh, you told us, Lord, that without you, Father, we can bear no fruit. And Lord, when we trusted you as our Savior, you began a work in our heart. You began a, a harvest, so to speak, in our lives. You began to produce these fruits in our lives. And Lord, many of us tonight, as we have looked at each and every fruit that we've looked at so far, maybe some of us are lacking, some of us are doing good in some, and then maybe a little, little, need a little help in others. And Lord, help us tonight to cultivate these things, to allow you uh, not to get in the way of what you're doing in our heart and life. Lord, all of us are in a process. All of us are in a journey tonight as you mold us more into your image, as you mold us more to being more like you. Father, that is the goal of salvation, Lord, that we become like you. And so, Father, help us tonight, Lord, to understand what it is with this fruit of faithfulness. Lord, we'll thank you for it. In your precious and holy name we do pray. Uh, amen. Amen. As we talked about earlier, that when we get saved... Uh, the Lord begins to do a work in our life. He begins to mold us. And uh, the point of being a Christian, and the phrase Christian means little Christ. It's the idea of Jesus reproducing himself into us. Uh, when we get saved, uh, he comes to live within. And he begins the renovation project within our lives. He begins to work on us and begins to produce love within us. Uh, it's a little easier to love once you uh, come to know Christ. I didn't say that it's difficult at times, but we are able now to love. We are able to experience joy. We are able to experience peace. We are able to experience long-suffering and exercise long-suffering uh, in our life. We are able to be kind. Uh, we are able to be obedient. Uh, and that's not something that we have to muster up. It's just something that is produced in our lives. It's not something that we have to work up. It's because it comes natural. Uh, because we're saved, we do these things. We bear these fruits. Again, you know, you've heard this illustration several times and you'll hear it a little more throughout the rest of the series. Uh, you know, an apple tree bears an apple tree, or apples. A banana tree bears bananas. You know, a pear tree bears a pear. Uh, why do they do those things? You know, I was kind of thinking about doing this tonight but decided against it. Uh, how many of you have ever seen those Geico commercials? Those funny ones, you know? What is it? Because it's what you do, you know? Uh, you know, about the operator, you know, he does what he does because it's what he does, you know. Uh, and th those are kind of comical. You know, my favorite one is the camel. You seen the camel one? Everybody's saying, hump day, hump day, hump day. You know, everybody's yelling at them, you know. And, and uh, it says, you know, why does the 
If, if you get talked about hump day and you're probably a camel because that's what you do. You know, you listen to hump jokes, you know. And so, uh, but anyway, you know the commercials. You know, the point of those whole commercials is you do what you do because you are what you are. And this is the idea of a Christian. You know, we are what we are and we do what we do because we are what we are. Uh, you know, because we are a Christian, these things are evident in our life. You know, it's a wonderful litmus test to, want to decide whether we're really in the faith or not. I mean, really, that's one of his points in this chapter is, you know, he's talking about the works of the flesh. He's talking about the fruits of the Spirit. And he, you know what he even says. He basically said that if you have a habitual lifestyle of sin, and we saw that in the earlier uh, chapter there in Galatians chapter 5, that they that do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of, uh, of God. And so we understand uh, that uh, because we're saved, these things are going to be evident in our life. These things, and you know, what do you say to an individual that doesn't possess any of these fruits? Well, I would say they're not saved. Uh, that's not me saying it, that's God saying it. God's saying that if you're saved, you're a Christian tree, then you're going to bear Christian fruit. It's just natural. It's a natural thing. Doesn't mean we're perfect, doesn't mean we've arrived. Uh, we're struggling in some of those things, I'm sure. If you're like me, you find some ouch moments when it comes to the fruit of the Spirit. You, you understand that God is still working in your life. And so uh, as we look tonight at faithfulness, we want to look at the definition. When we see the word faith, I know many of you see faith and not faithfulness, but the word there is actually a Greek term. It's a broad term for the word faith. And the word has the general idea uh, of faithfulness. When you see it in Scripture many times, especially in the New Testament, it implies the word faithfulness. It's talking about being faithful. Well, what is the definition? It is a firm devotion to God. It's loyalty to friends and dependability to carry out responsibilities. That's the idea of the word faith here. It's really talking about what we've come to know as faithfulness. It's talking about being dependable. It's talking about being devoted. All these words would be uh, synonyms for this meaning here. Uh, the word has the idea of a firmness or a constancy or maybe a, an idea of commitment uh, or trustworthiness. Uh, they best convey this meaning of the word faithfulness. Uh, King James Version uh, Study Bible said that it's fidelity. You know, those of you who do not know what fidelity means, it's just a strong allegiance showing a strong sense of duty. So it's a dutiful Christian, uh, which makes one true to his promise and faithful to his task. This word and this fruit has a lot to do with our sense of duty as a Christian. Now, I remember Dr. Cox teaching us in Bible classes. He says, you know, as Christians, uh, you know, you know we, we should desire to follow the Lord and we should desire to do what is right and desire to see people saved and desire to serve God and desire to come to the house of God. Dr. St Dr. Cox at the time had been a pastor and a Christian for many, many, many years. Very wise. A lot of things that I, I know, I know probably because of him and his influence in my life. But as I, I think about this word faith and faithfulness, the sense of duty comes to mind. And Dr. Cox said this, Some days as a Christian, we do what we do because it's our duty. Now we ought not serve God just because it is our duty. But some days we have to, right? You know what I'm talking about? It's those times you get up in the morning on Sunday morning and you don't feel like coming to church, but you know you need to be there. You know you need to be in the house of God. It's those times when you're presented with the right thing to do and you really don't want to do it because, hey, you know what God says, but you really don't want to do it. But it's your duty to do it as a Christian soldier of God. Hey, this is what we're talking about here. Faithfulness brings in the sense of duty that we as Christians have. We have a duty and obligation to our God. Hey, when you trusted Christ as your Savior... The Bible says we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus. You are, you are saying when you get saved, you are placing yourself under the authority of God in your life. You've realized you're a sinner. You realize you need His precious blood. You come to Christ. You're saved. And now you're underneath the authority of God Almighty. You have submitted to Him. You have repented of your sin. And that the idea there, of course, is that once we trust Christ, we are now 
in debt to Him. We are now uh, soldiers of the cross. It is our duty to be devoted to Him, our duty to follow Him, our duty to be close to Him. It's our duty. Faithfulness. Again, looking at the definition on the screen, there's a firm devotion to God. Notice the definition. It doesn't just say a devotion to God. It's talking about a firm devotion to God. Loyalty. Being dependable. Again, that's another aspect of this uh, word. Matter of fact, uh, a phrase comes to mind, full of trust. The idea of faithfulness implies being full of trust. The idea of trusting Jesus as we did when we've trusted Christ as our Savior and the idea of others being able to trust us. That's what this fruit implies. It implies that as Christians we are trustworthy. As Christians we can be counted on to do what we have to do. Dependability. Just as we depend upon God for our salvation, we have faith in Him. Again, that word also has that idea. But we also know that when we see it in this list, you know, hey, we're already saved. So what does God want us to do? Add salvation and salvation? No, that's what He's talking about. The word faith implies something more than just saving faith. And that's what we're talking about tonight. It's talking about our sense of duty and devotion and dependability when it comes to our relationship with God and fellow man. Let me ask you a question tonight. Do people see you as dependable in your workplace? Do people see you dependable at school, young folks? Do people see you as an individual who is devoted to the Lord? You see, the idea of devotion and the idea of, of, of being totally sold out to God, being faithful to Him... You know, we, we think about faithfulness and the very first thing I'm sure that you thought about was church, right? I mean, sure, we, we associate faithfulness with church and rightly so. We should associate that. But faithfulness is more than coming to church three times a week. Faithfulness is being devoted to God Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday and Sunday. We are to be faithful to God seven days a week, 24 hours a day. God expects us to be devoted to Him on the workplace. When we live for Him on the workplace, we live for Him in the home, we live for Him in all that we do. That is being faithful to God. And surely, uh, being a part of the local church is a part of that faithfulness. And, you know, again, that's why I, I, I seldom look at somebody and, you know, or, and look at people's life and I see that their relationship with a local church and I don't know people who name the name of Christ, but their relationship with the local church is horrible. Now, it kind of, I look at this because Jesus said that if you're saved, you're faithful. That's what he's saying here. Say amen if you agree with that. If you're saved, you're faithful. If you're not faithful, again, I, I know there's some fruits that we need to work on in our life. But one of the signs that you are truly born again is not that you love, not just that you love, not just that you have joy, not just that you have peace, not just that you possess long-suffering, not just that you're kind, not just that you're obedient, but it also has a lot to do with being faithful. One of the evidences of our salvation, one of the evidences that Jesus has come in is that we're faithful to Him and we're also faithful to His house. Those things are true. Again, the idea of being dependable. The idea of duty. We have duty. Now I'm going to tell you, as a pastor, are there some Sundays, they're very far and few in between. Or other Bobby, there's some Sundays that I'm up here because it's my duty. I don't feel like being here. I don't feel like doing it. Can, can I give you an illustration? A personal illustration and don't take it the wrong way. Last week, when I was up here, I didn't want to be here. I ain't going to lie to you. You don't want to know where I wanted to be? I want to be with my mama. I ain't going to lie to you. I want to be with my mama. I want to be right there where she was at. I'm going to be honest with you. Preaching was probably the farthest thing in my mind. I don't even know how I got through it. My wife was sick. I come home that night. I said, I don't know how I got through this day, but I did. It wasn't anything to do with my joy or anything like that. It's just, 
Again, you understand what I'm saying. I was here because I was expected to be here. It was my duty to be here. That's what God has called me to do. And some Sundays we show up because it's our duty. And that's okay. But don't make that every Sunday. Again, we do what we do because we enjoy doing it. Hey, I'm in church tonight, Miss Teresa, because I want to be here. Hey, I'm glad I'm here tonight. But some Sundays, John, some Sundays I come out of duty. Why? Because as a Christian, I'm faithful. I'm faithful to my God, and I'm faithful to His house. I'm faithful to Him on the job site. I'm faithful to Him on wherever I go. I am faithful. I'm a faithful servant of Him. Well, let's look at this real quickly tonight. The faithfulness exemplified in the life of Christ. Well, all these fruits, if you notice, have been exemplified. Jesus, as He walked this earth, He showed us what it meant to be faithful. And the Bible tells us a lot about the faithfulness of God. In every one of these fruits, we've seen this portrayed in our God and in, our, in the life of Christ. Well, it's very interesting. I found a few uh, uh, texts in the Old Testament. And, and when God, when used of God, talking about faithfulness, when faithfulness is used of God in the Old Testament, it frequently refers to His unwavering commitment to His promises. I like that. When the word faithfulness and God are together, most of the time it talks about God's unwavering commitment to you and I. Say amen if you believe God is faithful tonight. We see God's faithfulness in our life. We look at the life of Christ and it spells faithfulness. He was faithful to us when He didn't have to be. He made us His duty. He came to this earth to seek and to save that which is lost. That was His duty. He came to save. He came to rescue. And the Bible says to the very end, even to the point of death on the cross, Jesus remained faithful through the hardships Trust you, I want you to understand, you will face hardships in this life. That does not change the fact that you and I are to be faithful to Him. You know, everybody wants to use excuses why they're not faithful. Hey, if you're a pastor, you hear them all the time. Well, I had this and this and that. I'm so glad that Jesus never offered excuses. I can't go up the hill today because that's just too tough for me. I can't go up the hill of Calvary and, and put the cross on my back because then I, 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 they don't deserve that. No, he didn't give us any kind of excuses. He stayed faithful to his task. We see that in the life of Jesus. But Lamentations 3, 22 through 23, the Bible says it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. Amen to that. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. I'm glad that we serve a God that has great faithfulness. He's not just faithful. He has great faithfulness to you and I. I am so glad that even in the darkest of night, God is there beside me. He is faithful. He's faithful when I hit my knees and I pray to Him. He is there on the spot. Hey, I deserve hell tonight. Hey, you know where I deserve to be? In the very center of the lake of fire. But thanks be to God because, hey, He didn't consume us in our wickedness. But the Bible says He showed mercy to us. His Compassion fails not, and His mercies are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. We see that in the passage of Scripture. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 24. Paul talking to the Christian church of Thessalonica. He says, faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. I'm thankful that he is faithful tonight. God is faithful to you. He's faithful to me. If you've named the name of Christ, he is a faithful God to you and me. He is faithful. Hebrews 3 on 1 through 2, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of your profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him. So the Bible again declaring Christ as faithful. He fulfilled the duty that God has placed him. Now, the Bible also tells us in Hebrews chapter 12 that for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. But what we see here is the appointment. This is the duty side of the cross. You see, he was appointed by God to bleed and die for your sin and mine. That was his duty. But not only was it Christ's duty, it was also Christ's joy. You see, that is exactly the way God wants us to be. There needs to be a balance. So who was faithful? Jesus was faithful. 
Revelation 19.11 And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Revelation 19.11 here, I, I find it very interesting, referring to Christ on the white horse. We could, there, there's a hundreds and thousands of names that Jesus could have been referenced by. But what does the Bible reference him as? First there, faithful. Out of the many traits that our God possesses, Revelation 19.11 keys in on the faithfulness of our Lord. He truly is the faithful one. Jesus is our example. As we grow in Christ, He reproduces Himself within us. He was faithful, therefore, to be in Christ. It means that we be faithful. That we possess allegiance and devotion to Him. And that leads me to my last and final point tonight, and that is faithfulness commanded in Scripture. Faithfulness uh, to us. Now, we've just saw it in our God. We saw it in the life of Christ. Jesus was faithful. And that is a fruit here in Galatians 5.22 that He says as Christians we should bear to be uh, dependable to Him, to be devoted to Him in all that we do. It is a fruit that we should possess. Jesus was faithful to us and He desires that same faithfulness in us. We are to be as faithful to Him as He has been to us. Now I think if we were all honest, that's probably not the case in our lives, is it? We're, we're, we're probably not mastered this, many of us. How would Jesus serve you? Here's a question to ponder. How would Jesus serve you if He was as faithful as you are to Him? Let's think about it. I'm glad that Jesus doesn't base His faithfulness based on our faithfulness. Amen. I'm glad of that. But the, Jesus expects this in our life. Again, it's a fruit of the Spirit. God says these things ought to be growing and cultivating in our life. We ought not. And see, this is what troubles me about the church today. This troubles me a big, great deal. We have not gotten closer to God. We've gotten further apart. And it concerns me because, again, as a Christian... We are, what do we desire? We desire to get close to God. We desire to be devoted to God. We desire to be faithful to God. It concerns me about someone's salvation that does not have a desire to be devoted to God. And it concerns me that Christians today have nothing to do, many of them have nothing to do with the house of God. We're talking about the Bible here. And I've heard all the things... But I'm going to go with what God says. What does the Bible say when it talks about faithfulness being commanded, commanded in Scripture? Proverbs 3.3 3 tells us, Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Now, you may read that verse and say, Where in the world is faithfulness in that verse? Well, very interesting. The Hebrew word for truth there is our word for faithfulness. Well, God says here, Let not mercy and faithfulness forsake thee. I think faithfulness is very important. Now, I've heard a lot of people give me all kinds of excuses why they can't be in the house of God, why they can't be devoted to God. And boy, I've heard of all, all there is to know. Uh, I've got a book of 101 excuses and counting, you know. Uh, but let's, let's see what God thinks about faithfulness. Let's see what God says about being devoted to Him tonight. He tells us not to forsake uh, faithfulness, to possess faithfulness. Matthew 23, 23, he's rebuking the, the Pharisees and here's what he says to them. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, oh, for ye pay tithe of mint and ants and come and, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and what? Faith. These ought ye to have done and not to leave the other undone. The word faith there implies faithfulness. What was Jesus doing here? According to this passage, if I was to use no other passage but this passage, would you all agree with me and say, according to Jesus, faithfulness is a big deal? Because they were, they were given great offerings. 
They were, they were padding the temple with some great stuff. I mean, they were giving, man. They, they were giving like a rich man, and, and they were probably well off. And they were, they were doing some things right. On the outward, in the outward appearance, they were. But Jesus kind of confronts them, and he says, hey, those things there, hey, he even tells them, hey, you shouldn't have leave the other undone either, but there's some things that are lacking, and one of them was faithfulness. He zeroes in on their faithfulness and devotion to God. Now, mind you, I think this is very interesting too. It's a little spin on it. I'm sure they were in the temple because in order to give to the temple, they had to be where? So is it possible to be in church and not be devoted to God? Absolutely. You may be sitting here out of just lip service, out of appearance. That's why Jesus called them hypocrites. Jesus says faithfulness is a big deal. Being devoted to Him is a big deal. 1 Corinthians 4, 1 through 2. Let, no, let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mystery of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found what? Faithful. Anybody know what a steward is? The servant has this particular spin. It's not the original Greek word for servant. That would be doulos. Doulos is not there. What he's implying there by a steward is the idea of someone who has been entrusted with a property or some kind of task. It's the idea of someone giving you a house, and it's not your house, but they say, I want you to watch this house. I want you to keep this house. Jeremy watches our parsonage, watches our house while we're gone. He does a great job. You better. Amen. Baxter and Bellow tell on you. We leave, we get ready to go for vacation, we give Jeremy the rundown, and I leave and we, we, we get off the property. I have now entrusted the house to Jeremy. Jeremy, you didn't even realize it, but you have become a steward of something that is not yours. You have been entrusted with the welfare of the home and the protection of the home, the feeding of the dogs, the making sure that everything is good, making sure that alarms cut on and off, making sure all the things, the kitchen is clean, amen. Ladies, I got an announcement to, to make here. If you're looking for a man who lo he cleans really good, go see Jeremy. Our house is spotless. He, he's been entrusted with our home. And when we come back, we always have a smile on our face. Because my wife, she said it. She says, I don't have to do a thing. Because we've left it in his care. It's been entrusted. It's not his. It's our home. It's not... Hey, it's not his home, but he's been entrusted with it. And you know what, folks? Guess what? We're all stewards tonight. Because what you have tonight, God has given you. Say amen if you believe that. God has given it to you. And God... So we're all stewards. We've established the fact that we are stewards of something. God has given us all kinds of things. Hey, what are we stewards of? Well, here's a few things, not, not all of them, but here's a few things that we're stewards of. Did you know that you're a steward of your time? God has given you a specific amount of seconds, minutes, days, months, and years to live this life. Now, God knows how much that is. All of us have different times upon this earth. God has made us stewards of that time. God has entrusted us with the time He has given us to be devoted to Him to the best of our ability. Not only has He made us stewards of our time, He's made us stewards of kind of what we talked about this morning, stewards of our talents. He has given us talents. He has given us gifts to use. And He's made us the stewards of those talents. Hey, God, you didn't create yourself. God created you. He created your talents. He created your gifts. How are you using them for His glory? Hey, this is for you parents. God has given you, entrusted you with children. Grandparents, He's entrusted you with grandchildren. What kind of steward 
have you been with what God has given you? He's entrusted you with your family. He's entrusted you with your church. God has given you Belvoir Free Baptist Church. How well are you being a steward of Belvoir Free Baptist Church? God has entrusted you with material things such as money and wealth and whatever it is you have. And clothes on your back to the money in your bank account to the car you drive. God has blessed you and given and entrusted you with those things. The question is, how good of a steward are you? Because the Bible says, in order to be a good steward, you have to be found faithful. So we're all stewards tonight. And God's command to us all is to be devoted stewards. To be faithful stewards. How well are you doing, Mom? How well are you doing, Dad? With those children God has entrusted you. Are you being faithful to God in that regard? Are you being faithful to the church? Are you being faithful to the house of God? totally firm devoted to the things of God in your life? Are you being an accountable steward? One thing about being a steward, there's always that accountability date, right? Jeremy knows it. That last day of vacation, we come driving in. Here comes the accountability check. How well have you done? Are my dogs alive? Is our living room great? Is our our couches without holes in them? You know, there were times growing up, mom and dad entrusted me with the care of the home. They come back and there's glass shattered. They come back and there's a patch of carpet where the fire that I lit, trying to light a napkin and it falls out on the floor. And You know, I have to tell you, the board of education was mighty hard that day. I faced accountability for because I was entrusted with the welfare of the home. You know what? There's coming a day when we will be judged and be held accountable for how well we stewarded the things God gave us. The only thing that will be pleasing to Him is that we have, were faithful stewards. Faithful stewards. Revelation 2.10 Jesus talking to the church of Smyrna. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that ye may be tied. And ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death. And I will give thee a crown of life. Isn't that amazing? He could have tackled all kinds of subjects there. This church is suffering. They're going through pain. They're going through persecution. Some of their family members are dying because they've trusted Christ. But the thing that Christ highlights on, He says, Hey, be thou faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. God says, stick with me. Continue being devoted and loyal to me. That's what God wants of all of us tonight. Faithful unto death you know what I found out in the church today there's a lot of people what I call them used to Christians well I used to be faithful to the church preacher every time the doors were open we were there our family was there there was no ands ifs or buts about it hockey game or not we were there why because we were devoted to Christ But all of a sudden, the Word of God must have changed in 2015 because we're no longer as as faithful as we used to be back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. God has not changed. God's command is still the same. Be thou faithful unto death. It's a fruit of the Spirit. Hey, it's not something that I have to yank your ear on because according to God, it's something that comes natural to the Christian. Now, if you don't desire to be faithful to God, you don't desire to be in the house of God, there's a wonderful place here at this altar where you can give your life to God tonight. You can give your life to Christ. And then you can feel and know what it's like to have that desire to be close to God. In closing tonight, again, faithful comes natural to a Christian. 
That's who we are. Go back to the Geico commercials. We do what we do because we are what we are. It's what Christ produced in us. We are faithful because that's just the nature of a true Christian. I like what J. Vernon McGee said. He says, if you're a child of God, notice this, you will be faithful. This is scriptural. He's not stretching the scripture here. If you are saved, then you are faithful. If you are married, you will be faithful to your husband or wife. If you are an employee, you are going to be faithful to your job and to your boss. If you are a church member, you are going to be faithful to your church. You are going to be faithful wherever you are and whatever you do. Why? Because you're a Christian. It's that simple. I'm not faithful because I have to be. I'm faithful because that's just who I am. I'm telling you, there's a lot of people who name the name of Christ. But that's not so. Really needs to do some soul searching in the scriptures. And be sure there's salvation. You know what I've come to realize as a pastor? I'm only 32. But I've come to realize I ain't got to beg nobody to come to church. I've, I've beat that horse to death. I, I don't beg people to come to church no more. I'll tell you why. Because if you're truly saved, you're going to want to be here. Now, I'll beg the lost to come. I'll beg them all day long because if, if, if we don't beg the lost to come, they're not coming. But according to Scripture, I don't have to beg people to come. Is that Bible? It's Bible. Because Jesus said the fruit of the Spirit is faithfulness. Because we're saved, we're faithful. With every head bowed and every eye closed tonight.